ladies, that we are starting chapter five. So we're already starting the chapter, which is kind of a before and after. So now what's going to happen? And I don't know exactly where in chapter five we're off, where we stopped. So maybe if one of you knows, you'll tell me. Um, while I'll give, while I'll also give a little bit of background of what's going to happen in this chapter. What's going to happen in this chapter is he's going to go through the before and after. What what is life or what was life without Pitachon and what is life with Pitachon? So he's going to do that contrast for us, which obviously is going to help us catch ourselves when we are and not and, and you know know where we want to be right um so you know i like to call it it's like bitahon at work you know it's bitahon literally at work before and after um now i think we did the part that's about always grateful does anybody know exactly what page we're on i want to put on the chat or tell me I think it's 216 that's where my marker was I don't... 216 216 is pro it's it's possible it's possible we got that far that's very interesting okay so we are, we are that far um 216 hmm. 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 okay so let me do a little bit of a recap because I'm not so sure so the first contrast compare and contrast that he does okay is what they call here in our white book on the Felig edition, always grateful. So here we see the guy who was thankless um, and then the person who became um, a, 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 a person with gratitude. Um, I know we covered that because as I, I, and now I'm remembering. Then we have what they call here happy-go-lucky. This is this person who was miserable all the time, um, and we talked about the person who's content, who is happy, who's at ease. He's, you know, he has a state of tranquility, um, both when things are not going so great as he wants and when things are going great. Um, he's just even kilter, right? He's just easy going. That's why I say happy go lucky. Then I talked about um, proper attitude. So here we talked a little bit about this person at work who is like obsessed with work and, you know, to an, ex to an extreme, right? To the point that he could be, you know, kind of like backstabbing kind of person. Um, and versus a person with Bitahon who is very, oh, Alexia's here, how nice. Um, a person with Bitahon who is pretty chilled, right? He goes about his work, but he's not obsessed with it. With it. He's not emotionally attached to it in the way that most of us know, right? It's kind of like how we we are the the way we learned to relate to to our means of a livelihood and what we see out there in the world so you know this person is the opposite of that and then we talked about in 211 they talk about budgeting properly meaning this guy budgets properly so here we talk about this person without bitahon how how does he behave with money well he's very stingy and with bitahon he is generous so without bitahon he's a hoarder he doesn't give it for anything and with Bitachon, the person knows what to do with his money. He knows that the money is for Torah and, and mitzvot and for sharing with others. And then 12, 212, we talked about the career choice of the person. Um, and I, I, I kind of feel like I should start there, even if, even if it takes us back, only because we weren't together for a while. So I just want to start there. Um, let's talk about that, the fifth difference or the fifth contrast of before and after, okay? So this is what I call, it's like, again, this concept of being ethical and straight in your in your career and your the way you work and, um, and being kind of unethical or being like totally obsessed and like it just, it's everything to you and just, and being chilled. So it's kind of this attitude. So let's look at it inside, 212. A person who relies on God involves himself in the various worldly means of making a livelihood so that he will be able to prepare provisions for the end of his days and for his ultimate resting place in the world to come. Therefore, he engages only in those means of livelihood that will clearly allow him to preserve his Torah learning and his world to come. Oh, we do. We did do this, but it doesn't matter. It's good to review. So he's not going to engage in any means that will cause loss of Torah learning or that it will lead to rebellion against his creator so that he does not bring upon himself spiritual illness instead of healing. Since the person's sole intention when engaging in his livelihood 
is that this is what God wants him to do. Remember, we talked about that, that this is a form of divine service. Like the reason we are working is because God asked us to work. Sorry, I have like, God asked us to work. So this is because God wants him to, to do it. It is inconceivable that he will engage in a means that will somehow compromise his mitzvah observance and Torah learning. So he understands that one thing is not antithetical to the other. Just because he has to work doesn't mean he's not going to, I saw a video today, some some attorney, some big attorney was saying that um, she was saying in the video, people say that observing Torah mitzvahs is limiting. I'm here to tell you it's not limiting. It doesn't limit my life, right? And she was talking about, you know, how she went, had always a, a religious education and whatnot. Um, and then she went on and got her degree and then she went on to get her college degree and then she I mean her law degree um, and she became I, I don't know she's like a high high attorney or whatever and it's the point being that she said you have to stand up for oh she said you have to stand up for your morals and you have to know who you are and you go out in the world knowing who you are and yes you have to say you know what it's Friday afternoon and that's it and she said it's it was it, it was very very hard um, at times but the, 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 it's not negotiable. So this person with the tachon knows when I work, I work, but it's not there going to affect my Torah observance. In fact, I'm working because it's part of my Torah observance, meaning it's part of what God wants me to do. Um, this attitude is in stark contrast to the person who lacks pitachon, right? Because what is a person who lacks pitachon? He engages with with the means of livelihood, thinking this is this is the thing, this is the only important thing. A person who does not rely on Hashem relies on the means in which he engages for his livelihood and rests his mind upon them. Do you see this phrase? Rests his mind upon them. Meaning the real estate space of his head is completely consumed by making a livelihood, right? His work. Therefore, he will not distance himself from any of those means engaging in both praiseworthy and inappropriate means. Since he places his trust in the means themselves, he engages in both permitted and forbidden means in the pursuit of livelihood, whatever it takes, right? Whatever it takes, because this is it. This is the end and be all. He does not think about the end of his days, as the wise man King Solomon said about them. A wise man fears and turns away from evil, and the verse continues that the fool passes vigorously and slips. The verse contrasts the wise person who is cautious and avoids evil because of his fear of Hashem with the fool who is overconfident and therefore slips. Okay, so now the next contrast, the before and after, is love and beloved, which I called hated versus beloved. So we're going to see here an individual... When, when he doesn't have bitachon, when a person doesn't have bitachon, people feel, you know, there's this like th this negative vibe, you know, that that maybe that person is going to um, be backstabbing or, you know, try to take the job from me or my wife from me. Or, you know, that kind of like yeah, there's something about that person that but when a person has bitachon, everybody trusts them. Everybody loves them. Because, again, we've talked about this in terms of interpersonal relations. He's not looking to get anything out from anyone else or to hurt anyone else to benefit him because he knows nothing. He, there, there's nothing. Nobody can benefit or harm him other than Hashem. So in a sense, it makes him very attractive, very beloved. People are drawn to this person. And we all know people like that, right? They're so authentic. They're so genuine. They're, they don't have a bad bone in their body. Like when you're with them, you never feel threatened. You never feel like they're jealous of you, like non-judgmental, not, crit not critical, none of that, right? That's because they are just with Hashem. And so it people feel it. There's a, there's a vibe. A sixth difference. A person who relies on Hashem is beloved by all types of people. And they feel at ease with him because they feel secure that he will not harm them. And their hearts are at peace because of him. They are not afraid of his taking their wives or their money. He, right? He's not going to take anything from them. <laughs> he too feels secure with them. Right. He to he also feels secure with other people because he knows that his benefit or harm are not in the hands of any creation, nor is it in their power to do either good or bad to him. Right. So he's very relaxed in his interpersonal relations. Therefore, he is not afraid of their harming him just as he does not expect to benefit from them. He's very authentic since he feels secure with them and they feel secure with him. He will love them and they will love him as it is written. And the one who trusts in Hashem 
kindness will encompass him. So this is actually a very, very important verse from Tehillim. We should kind of like in internalize it. The person with bitachon does not see other people as a threat to his success. And he will therefore find himself surrounded by people who love him and wish to do kindness with him. And we all know people like this in life. You know, I remember there was a time where we had, we had a business relationship um, with two individuals. Happens to be that these two individuals independently were investors in a company that we were that we we had started. And one of these two individuals were related by marriage, like they were married into the same family or whatever. And one of these individuals was very jealous of the other one. And it was a very uncomfortable relationship because it was all about like, well, you can't let them know that I am an investor and you can't give them like, you have to make sure that like, there were like these weird situations where like, if you had to write their name, their name had to be on top or like, it was just like so weird because like there was this jealousy, be not between the one towards the other, the one person, the other one is like a, a, a doll, right? But but it was just so such bad vibe like bad vibes to feel that like somebody who was so jealous of the family member you know like it was just weird so we all know people like that that kind of like are always looking to and there were just like always comments like that um like how much did he invest and da 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 da, da like very strange or I had a I had a friend my friend's um my friend's mother years ago I remember she said whenever I go out with whatever family member. I can never wear my jewelry. And I remember I was very young and it kind of shocked me. And she said, I go without anything because if I have jewelry, she'll start saying, oh, he got you this and he got you that. Oh, that's new. I never saw it. Oh, my husband doesn't get me anything. And then I like, and I remember she's like, it's such bad, but like, it just, ugh, it's like, no. Right. So again, we talk on people, <laughs> allow people to have what they have. You don't have to covet anything from anyone. You can do you and they can do themselves. Okay, so let's see. Conversely, a person who does not rely on God has no friends because he always covets what others have and is jealous of them, right? So there you go. The story with my friend's mother and her family member. She couldn't go out with jewelry to lunch with this other lady. He considers any good that comes to them to have been removed from him. He believes, right? Like if, if, like it, like, any good that came, comes to, oh wait, he considers any good that comes to them, to the other people, well, they took it from me, right? If other people have something going for them, right? Oh, it's like, it was like taken from me. When we know that that is impossible, nobody can take what's yours, right? If you have it, it's because number one, you need it. And it's not accessible to anyone else. Nobody can touch it. But these, this person feels like whatever somebody else has means that it was taken from them, means that they don't have when it's, there's no, no relation. Okay. Whatsoever. He believes that their livelihood was taken from his livelihood and that all desires that have been denied from him is because of them. Or that at the very least it is in their hands to help him attain his desires. So you understand the psychology of this character, this the psychology that's one going on here, right? It's, it's a very, also vi very victim mentality, right? Like, like, ugh, like so, they're out to get, got, get me. Nobody's out to get you. Nobody can touch what's yours. If bad things happens to him or he has trouble with his money or with his children, he will think that it is because of them or that at the very least it is in their hands to rid him of the harm and to push away the bad from him. So the person who lacks bitachon sees other people as a threat to his success and he is constantly jealous of what they possess. Furthermore, he blames his misfortune on them by convincing himself that they are either the source of his lack of success or that they are able to help him, but are unwilling to do so. It sounds like the anti-Semite, <laughs> right? It's like the anti-Semite who blame everything on us, right? <laughs> everything, right? Do you, do your life. We don't, we, we don't, we don't have anything to do with you. Since the principles have been fixated in his mind, he will come to despise other people as a result of this and to denigrate them, to curse them and to hate them. Such a person is loathed in both worlds and is disgraced in both residences, this world and the world to come. 
And the verse, as the verse states, he who is of a perverse heart will find no good. These mean this means that he will not find good both in this world and in the world to come. So it's really, it's really a very sad reality, honestly. So remember, I always tell you, like this is a this is a book not just about making a living, not just about the way you relate to your doctor or your job. It really it has a lot to do with the way you relate to others. And here we have it so clearly. Okay. So with bitachon, you can have really healthy relationships. Without bitachon, you you know, God forbid, you see you see you see what we turn into. Um, okay, so the seventh difference we're about to um, start it is he, they call it here live in the moment. It's kind of like you know being dissatisfied, this like this angst and not being satisfied where you are versus being satisfied okay that's the that's the contrast here a person who relies on Hashem will not be worried if his request is denied or if he loses that which is beloved to him he doesn't hoard his possessions which we learned before nor does he concern himself with making efforts to obtain obtain more livelihood than for that day alone for he doesn't entertain in his heart and worry about what will happen tomorrow because he doesn't know when his end will come. You know, it's very interesting because this is this is just such a hard thing for all of us. You know, we get so impatient and it's like, can we just reframe, reframe everything? Like it, it's almost like there's money in the bank or there's food in the refrigerator. And yet we're worried. Oh, but what if on Friday I can't pay my mortgage or or what am I going to do tomorrow? But, but what about today? Right. It's it's a real avoda. I'm telling you, it's a re it's real work and real discipline. The, the, the bitachon piece and, and really rewiring ourselves, our brain, so that we are in the present. But right now you are safe. But right now you have a roof over your head. But right now you have health. But right now you have a family. Oh, like you know, I, I have these conversations with people all the time. And the brain, it's like, it's like the brain immediately goes to no, no, but like. In two days, I have to pay this. Oh, no, no, but like my friend's husband passed away suddenly. You're right. No, no, no. But right now, right now, right? The brain, it always tries to take you to what What could be? When is the shoe going to drop? You know that expression? Like the other shoe is going to drop, right? When is the other shoe going to drop? Here, right now, we are safe. You have what you need. You have food in the refrigerator. You have your car works, you're this, you're that, like, my goodness, like, really, it takes so much work, but it really can change us if we can practice being in the moment. So this is this person, this person with Bitachon is in the moment. Sorry, we keep getting people joining us today. It's great. Okay, so since he doesn't know how long he will live, he relies on Hashem for his very life, and he will therefore rely on Hashem for his livelihood as well. Just as he relies on Hashem to lengthen his life, so too, he relies upon him to provide him with food and livelihood for his lifetime. He does not rejoice in anticipation of the good fortune that he expects in the future, nor does he worry or feel afraid about any future bad that may befall, befall him. So again, it's just like even kilter. Like he's just happy where he is, right? He's just happy where he is. And I think sometimes it's also a little bit confusing because it's like, well, can I dream bigger? Can I also be, you know, like, and we've talked about this before, how the Lubavitcher Rebbe said, like, like in that Hayyam Yum from, um, what did I tell you guys it was? It was coming up. It's in Adar Base, in second Adar. I think it was the 16, right? Like the business person has to feel as excited as if the deal was already in his hands. I'm not sure it was a business person he was talking to, but I'm pretty sure it was. Okay, I'll have to look it up for next week. But so you have to have that feeling, right? And even the sikhas that we've learned on Bitachon with the Rebbe, the Rebbe talks about that higher level of Bitachon where you're living, you're feeling it as if it's right here, right? And the whole concept we've talked, the whole concept of Mashiach, like it's like it's right here. Instead of the, instead of, you know, somebody was saying, well, I think it was Michael Saf Saf Safdi was saying maybe this morning or yesterday in the Bitachon, daily Bitachon, um, instead of us saying like, oh, did you hear what happened? He's like, no, no, no. Like, did we hear what happened? Meaning like we had breakfast and we had food and we can walk and we can breathe and we have our children and our parents are like, like, what, why don't we talk about that instead of all the bad, right? It's, it's, it's so, it, it just, we have to be so careful, right? And, and, and live in the, in the joy of the moment, right? And, and leave the negativity away. It doesn't mean that we don't feel for other people. It doesn't mean that we don't help them out, okay? It means that we try as much as we can 
to live in the reality of I am blessed at this moment. And that is amazing. And everything that I have right now is so good right? It's, 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 it's just, it's, it's, it's work. What can I tell you? It's daily, daily work. The author now first cites a verse that states that a person should never rejoice in anticipation of any good that is to come. Hmm. He follows it with a source that supports the concept of never fearing any bad that may come. So here it's talking about a very, very important contrast. Just like we shouldn't take our brain to like this place of like, so, so anxiety of the bad that's going to come. Also, don't live in this over over arrogance confidence, okay? Which is again very different from what I'm talking before about like the excitement and the joy joy of what can be, and like it can be. It's here, like feeling like you're holding it, right? Like like you know you're dancing in a few hours at your child's wedding. How excited are you going to be, right? So you need to feel like that right now, right? Like that's how excited I am. That feeling. So it's not that is allowed what's not allowed is to live in like this what's what's the word it's like um it, let me let, let's read it inside and it'll come to me as the verse says do not boast that's the word that's the word do not boast about tomorrow for you do not know what the day will bear ben Sira said grieve not about tomorrow's trouble because you do not know what today's may bring perhaps tomorrow he will no longer be and he will have worried about a world that is not his meaning if you be cut meaning you have to understand the difference here the difference is being so me-centered that you're anxious about what's going to be tomorrow and you're arrogant or the opposite. You're completely arrogant about what's going to be tomorrow. Excuse me? Humility. Where's Hashem in the picture? What do you know? What do you know? What do you know? It doesn't mean you can't be joyful. Okay. It means be humble. Understand it's all from Hashem. Don't like, don't, don't think you have, you know, like, you know, so sometimes there's, there's people like, I don't know how to explain it, but it's a level of arrogance. Okay. So that's really what it's talking about. It's contrast. It's giving us these two extremes that a person without bitachon could fall could fall to, the anxiety and the worry of tomorrow, or the ugh, the such 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 like level of not connecting to Hashem that they feel so overconfident about everything in a way that it's completely it com you know. In, in a way that obviously leaves God out of the picture, okay? A person doesn't know what will happen tomorrow. He might not even be alive. Therefore, there's no reason to worry about the future, right? And, and that's really, that's really again, training for all of us because most, most of us, like, we're completely fine today, but we're already like, oh my gosh, but tomorrow, but tomorrow, how am I going to pay for this? How am I going to do that? Da, 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 da. And it's like, can we just... Can we just help the brain go back to now, to the now, to the present, Okay. A person who has bitachon is concerned solely with matters pertaining to his service of Hashem. Ah, so when I have bitachon, my mind is just preoccupied with Hashem, right? How am I going to, how am I serving Hashem right now, right? And so that, that helps me stay in this, in this even kilter mode. Rather, his worries and grievances are regarding his inability to fulfill his obligations to the creator. And he makes an effort to pray to pay those obligations that he's able to pay both those that are apparent as in the mitzvahs that are performed with the person's body and those that are hidden as in the mitzvahs that are duties of the heart. Right? That's what he's concerned about. Not concerned about like, sometimes we get so caught up, right? When we have everything, we have so much. Ah, but like some, some people, some, some, no, but when I go to see my friend or when I go to this place, right? I, I, I don't really have that much. I don't really, can we just stop with the comparing can we stop with the comparing and be now in this moment and realize that whatever we have is because that's exactly what we need. And that doesn't mean that in a second it can't be different and in 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 in, in either sweeter packaging, 100%, that's what that, that's that's what bitachon is, right? You have to know that in a second it could be even sweeter. I can give it to you in the package that you want, but you have to believe it. The moment you're complaining, you're already not believing and that's what people don't get. The moment you're complaining about what you have right now, be, the, it's not going to work. It doesn't work because you've already lost the belief. You've already lost the trust. You have to be in the moment, appreciate the moment and know that it could be, it could be amazing. And people have that dance is very, very hard for all of us. Okay. 
He is concerned about this because he thinks about his death and the coming of the day when his soul will be gathered back to its source and the world to come. His fear of sudden death arouses him in alertness to increase his efforts and to prepare provisions for the end of his days, and he will not heed what he provides for himself in this world. This is what is meant with the statement, repent one day before your death. And the rabbis explain in the Talmud he should repent today because perhaps he will die tomorrow and it emerges through such conduct that all his days were spent repenting. So a, a person who knows his attitude is, look, we don't. it's all in Hashem's hand. Nothing is given. Like, I don't have to be here today. And by the way, I also don't have to have my health here today. Thank you, Hashem, for my health. Thank you, Hashem, for my clothing, for my clothes. The house is standing. Nothing happened today. Like, I have everything. Like, I woke up again. I'm breathing. I'm healthy. I'm, like, why, why do we take it for granted? It shouldn't be taken for granted, right? So he's in the moment. He knows like any, like Hashem doesn't have to recreate the world tomorrow. It's good that he does. And it's good that we trust that he does. Otherwise we'll go crazy. We have to have that sense of stability. It's a, it's a chesed and a kindness from Hashem that he makes nature, that he actually makes nature. It's actually an incredible concept. I just read it in another book, right? I never thought about it, but what a kindness from Hashem that he actually gives us nature so that we we live in this illusion that, oh, everything flows, right? Otherwise we'd be going crazy. And the irony is that we're still going crazy. We're still going crazy, but really we shouldn't. It's such a kindness from Hashem. We go crazy, you know why? Because we forget who is running nature. We forget who's the puppeteer. That's what we go crazy. If we don't, if we remember, if we're completely in tune with a the puppeteer, then we don't go crazy. Okay. Um, as it is written, at all times that your garments be white, which is understood by Rashi to mean that the person's soul should be clean and pure as a result of his repentance. So this person with Vitachan is always focused on his real identity. What's my identity? Is my soul? I have to worry. <laughs> That's my concern. That's my concern. I'm here. You know, like Rab Susha, when, the, when he was passing away and the sages, the, his his disciples said, Susha, why are you nervous? <laughs> You're the great Rab Susha. And Rab Susha said, you know, when I go up there, they're not going to ask me, Susha, why weren't you like Moses? Or Susha, why weren't you like Abraham? They're going to ask me, Susha, why weren't you Susha? Right? So in this world, we have to live Yael, why weren't you Yael, right? Susha, why weren't you Susha? Nobody else is going to be you. It's all, it's just you. So did, am I doing everything that my soul, <laughs> that I need to do for my soul in this journey that it has in this world? It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a, it, that, that should be our concern. All of this awareness is in stark contrast to the person who lacks bitachon. Conversely, a person who does not rely on Hashem will be greatly pained due to the constant troubles that befall him. The loss of his friends and his requests being denied from him, right? He's constantly frustrated. He will save up a great fortune of the world for himself as if he's assured that he will be spared from being transferred from this world to the next. The fear of death is removed from him as if his days will never cease to be and his life will never end, right? So it's so, such arrogance that he doesn't even like realize that, you know, we all end up in the same place and it, it could happen any minute. He does not think about what will happen to him at the end of his days, involving himself instead in worldly matters alone. He does not pay attention to matters of his observance of the Torah and to how much provision he has prepared for when he will go to his ultimate resting place. His confidence that he will live a long life in this world is the cause for his constant desires for personal matters. And it is also the cause for his decreased desire for spiritual matters, which are needed for the world to come. Now, I, I want to pause here and tell you a story because he's he's now wrapping this, this section up and, and kind of in, wrapping the, this with the, the focus and like the contrast being like the person without Bitachon um, is not focused on, on, on his divine service and his world to come. And he's going to introduce the next chapter with this last paragraph. So before I move into this topic a little bit further, I want to go back to this idea of how he started this section with a person without Bitachon being dissatisfied and constantly frustrated versus the person with Bitachon who is in the moment and he he's he's joyful in the moment. And by telling you the story that I'm sure I shared before, I mean, I don't know if this iteration or another iteration of our class, but my friend Margie told me the story about Mr. Sammy Rohr. Um, and many years ago, um, my friend Margie's husband, Roberto, was meeting with Mr. Mr. Rohr and asked him, you know, 
Sammy, how, how is it that you, well, I don't know if you called him on a first name basis, maybe not, but Mr. Rohr, how is it that, um, how is it that you're such a happy person, right? Now, Mr. Rohr was a very wealthy individual. He was an immigrant um, and, you know, he, he made a lot of wealth and he gave a tremendous amount of charity and, and Roberto asked him, how is it that you're such a happy person? Like he wants, he's just interested to know like how other successful people think and what may, you know, and Mr. Rohr started giving him a very interesting answer. He says, you know, Roberto, you see this, this, this home, this apartment. Yeah. He says, you know, this is the best apartment. So Roberto thinks in his head, you know, it's, it's very nice, but like, I mean, he has a nice apartment, but it's not like the, as we say in Spanish, like the apartment, you know, it's not a nice apartment in Miami, but I like it. Okay. okay. So he's like, you know, it's a good apartment. He says, no, no, Roberto, it's the best apartment. And he says, you see my car outside? You've seen my car outside? Yeah. He knows he knew, he knew Mr. Roar's car. Roberto, it's the best car. We're just thinking, you know, like it's not a Tesla, it's not the Ferrari, the Maserati, the, it's just like an American good stable. I don't know what those days it was, maybe it's a, I don't know, Chrysler or Cadillac, something, a good car, but like not the, you know, the best car. Robert, do you see my wife? See my wife? I have the best wife. The story is so powerful. Because at that moment, Roberto realized that is why he's so happy because everything that he has is the best. It has nothing to do with it. It's, look at what, what I, I see it as the best. And you know, what's so interesting. I shared this story and then I heard, then I heard like, it just kind of like got read and I got feedback from, um, from Mr. Rohr's daughter who said, you know, it's so true what Yale wrote about my father. That was exactly how my father was to the point that when my daughter got engaged, I was nervous. She said, I was nervous because they were so young and, and you know, like you're a mother, you're nervous. What? So I went to my father and I said, I said, Tati, like, like you know, how am I going to know if that's the right husband? And she said, and he said to me, Lily, He's going to, when she's married, she he's going to be the best husband. And she says, and you know what? He is the best husband, and he's the best daughter, son-in-law. That's it's all a perspective. It's all a perspective. That's the point. It's a perspective that we have to have. You have the best husband, and you have the best children, and you have the best house. Oh no, but it's not as big and it's not as fancy and it's not all. Oh, but my husband's not like my 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 friend's husband and my cousin's husband. And like, no, no, no. If you have it, it's because it's the best. God's not giving you something that's not the best. It's the best for you. You have, you know, we make a joke in my house because like we have to buy a car. It's like, you know, I think I told you guys before, we're like in this hunt for a car, but we're not like, we are, we're like these people that dread car shopping. Like it's so not our, like, I'm like, who can I pay to come bring me the car? Okay. I do not want to do investigation. I don't want to negotiate. I don't want to go test drive anything. Somebody just bring the car already to my driveway, you know, kind of thing. Okay. And my husband's the same, right? It's a joke. The car, we need a car, right? But then we get in the car and it's so tempting to criticize the car. But like right away, we make a joke out of it and we realize it's the best car. And look how many mitzvahs this car has done. And like the car's still going and like my our kids are already like oh my gosh you guys are not normal you know because to them it's like can we get a car already it's making very strange sounds I'm like but look it's the best car look it's like it's taking on so many miles look at these comfortable leather seats I mean they're still going it's like amazing car right and they're like ma it's like from 2009 <laughs> It's the best car. And, you know, because we call it the best car, the car's still going. <laughs> the car's still going. All right. So, uh, okay, so where are we? Okay, so now I'm going to tell you, he's going to wrap this up with, like, this last paragraph about what this individual who doesn't have bitachon, he's not paying attention to his divine service. He's not concerned with the needs of his soul. He's not concerned about his world to come. And what happens is, last paragraph in page 218, is that when a person rebukes him or a teacher guides him in the proper way to behave and says to him, 
Until when will you be unconcerned with the provisions that you need to prepare for the world to come and with the matters of your ultimate resting place? He responds by saying, listen to this, when I will have enough money to provide for my food and other needs and for those who are my responsibility, i.e. my wife and children, for our entire lives, only then will I rest my mind from the worries of this world turn to pay my responsibilities to the creator and think about the means that will enable me to obtain the provisions for the world to come. So he, the author is right now wrapping up this chapter with his description of the person who's lacking bitachon um, and in this contrast of like, um, you know, the satisfied versus the satisfied. And he's saying this type of person, he's so dissatisfied that has the chutzpah to think when Hashem gives me all funds, all of my accounts, right? And has all the money for all the weddings of my children and for that, for all of it, I can take care of everybody. Then I'll show up to Minyan. Then I'll keep Shabbos. Then I'll, I don't know what, go to Mikvah. Then I'll keep kosher. But for now, I got to run this business. When Hashem shows me that I sell the business and the money's in the bank, then I'll take care of everything else. And it's all an introduction to chapter six which is what we call in the trash home, the show me the money mentality, okay? So this character that he just introduced is exactly what who he's going to debunk in chapter six, okay? So he's going to take this mindset and he's going to give an entire chapter just to deal with this, this sickness of thinking that Hashem needs to give me. And then when he shows me, as though Hashem is not showing us kindness already, right? Do you understand the craziness that we, right? when he shows me, then okay, fine. Okay, fine. So, okay, so we'll make some adjustments then. Then of course we'll start buying the kosher meat. But for now, no, I'm sorry. Until the accounts are fun funded, sorry, too expensive, right? Okay, so it's a sickness. So let's, let's move into chapter six and let's understand what this show me the money mindset is all about. Page 222. The previous chapter concluded with the attitude of a person who lacks bitachon in regard to his duties towards Hashem. Such a person will first ensure that all his needs are met and only then will he contemplate his duties towards God. This chapter will post seven responses to such a person, illustrating how foolishly mistaken he is to delay paying his obligations. Torah mitzvahs until he has material prosperity. So he's going to show us how it's a foolishness of, in, in this person's part. Okay. So let's see the security mentality or the show me the money mentality. I have seen that it is necessary to expose with seven points, the foolishness and errors of those people who engage in this way of thinking. Although we will need to elaborate on this, it is nonetheless important to do so because the following seven points contain substance with which to embarrass and rebuke the people who have this way of thinking, i.e., it happens to us, okay? So he's literally like taking our brain and like ripping it apart every time. And every other chapter, he's just telling us, okay, catch yourself how you're thinking, catch yourself how your brain works, okay? These people are called the sect of owners of security pledges. That's what he calls them. Okay, so who are they? They don't trust, they don't trust that God will take care of them. So they take a security pledge from him, a guarantee that if they live a long time, they will have what they need. Only when they have their security pledge in hand, meaning that they feel confident of having enough wealth for the rest of their lives, do they in turn do they turn to give God what they owe him, namely the observance of mitzvahs. So again, this person is completely, we have it completely upside down. Understand? Completely upside down. Not only are we not in the moment, but we don't, understand, we don't even understand where the moment is coming from. The moment is coming from your creator. So develop your relationship with your creator first and then with everything else. Fine. But you can't give one, it's not one at the expense of the other. No, no, no. You have to have your relationship with your creator because that's where everything is flowing from. Also, how could you be so such an ingrate, right? But again, we miss the point because we forget that it's all about the relationship. We forget. And that's what it's all about. Who am I in a relationship with? My creator. Okay, so let's read it inside. Their conduct towards Hashem is akin to a merchant who sells on credit to a person whom he does not trust to pay. Okay, so imagine a business. I'm a salesperson, and I and I and I, I sell to them on credit, um, but I don't tr I don't trust them. So if I don't trust them, I, I have to take some uh, security, right? I have to take some collateral. Okay, 
He therefore takes a security pledge at the time of the sale out of fear that the buyer can't be trusted or that the buyer won't be able to pay for the merchandise that he purchased. Okay, that's that's that that, that that's what's done. Okay, so the person who concerns himself with his obligations only after he has material prosperity doesn't trust that Hashem will pay him in return for his service of Hashem. And he therefore takes a security pledge from him in advance, meaning that's the attitude. It's as though you're at, you're you're taking a pledge, a security pledge from Hashem. So why is this completely flawed? This trying to get collateral from Hashem. Let's see. The first response we say to such a person is this: You're a person who doubts if all a person's needs have been preordained by the decree of the Creator, and who doesn't believe in the greatness of God's strength and ability. You're a person whose light of intellect has been darkened and whose candle of understanding has been extinguished due to the darkness of your desires overcoming you. So it's like your entire judgment has been clouded. Like you don't, you're not even, you're not see the light anymore. Like, you don't, you don't understand where everything is coming from. The only reason why a person denies Hashem's power is because he gives in to his desires. He's just so, so self-centered. In truth, it should be apparent that all of a person's needs are in the hands of Hashem. So if all of your needs are in the hands of Hashem, how could you not establish a relationship with Hashem? How could you ignore where all the blessings are coming from? Surely it is only appropriate for you to request and take a security pledge from your fellow or friend who has no jurisdiction over you and cannot give you orders. However, it is not appropriate for a paid worker who is hired by people to take a security pledge for his pay from his employer before he begins to his work. Can you imagine? You're an employee. You're getting, you got hired. You're, you're getting paid. And you haven't even begun your work. And you say, I don't know, but by the way, I need like, like five, five years of salary before I start working here. Right? So that's what, what's happening here. Oh, no, 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 Hashem, you, you gotta, get, gotta give me the entire runway. Gotta, gotta show me everything. Show me the money. And then I'll start working. Right? All the more so will a servant not take a security pledge from his master for his livelihood before he has begun to work for his master. Can you imagine? The servant takes a pledge from his master. And all the more so that a created being will not take a security pledge from his creator before he even begins serving Hashem. You can't even breathe without Hashem. What are you talking about? You want Hashem to show you all the money for the rest of your life and for your children until the end of their days. Like, What are you talking about? You, 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 you don't even know if you're going to be here the next minute. Like, right? <laughs> it is astonishing because even when a servant serves his master with the intention of being rewarded after his work, it is considered improper. So even we're not even talking about asking for collateral. Even 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 if he serves his master with the intention of being reward, rewarded, which okay, is only natural, right? That is already considered improper. The sages say in Perkeabus, do not be like servants who serve their master in order to receive reward. Meaning you should be serving because you want to serve right? We should be serving Hashem because we want to, right? We should be, we should be wanting to be in the relationship. You don't make dinner or go get a, a cup of water for your spouse or make a coffee for your spouse or whatever it is, because you're looking for a reward. Because you want your husband to get you a piece of jewelry, God forbid. What, what the, what, what's that, right? Like, what is that? Are you in a relationship, right? A healthy relationship is developed, is nurtured. You're not looking to get something out of them, okay? All the more so, it is improper when the servant is so brazen-faced that he asks for a security pledge for his livelihood before he begins his work. Similarly, the verse states, is this how you pray the Lord, you disgraceful and wise people? So, okay, so this person doesn't understand who's boss, and he wants to take collateral from his boss before he starts working for the boss. A distinction is drawn between the regular case of taking a security pledge and the person without bitachon. So here, he's going to make a, a little bit more of an extreme case here. The second response to the person without bitachon. Usually when a person takes a security pledge from his friend, the value of the security pledge is limited according to the amount of the debt, right? If you're, if you're extending credit to someone and you're taking collateral, it's going to be commensurate with whatever it is that you're, that, that the loan that you're giving, right? What's happening here? Imagine a person is asking of Hashem, okay? 
imagine the amount, the amounts that they're asking for. However, the person who has the this way of thinking mentioned above has no end to what he seeks from God because he doesn't know how much money will be enough to sustain him and the members of his household for their food and other needs until the days of their deaths. How can you calculate how much that is? Even were he to have many times more money than that which in truth would be enough for him, his mind will not be at rest because their end is concealed. You don't know when the end is and the length of their days is unknown. He is a fool for seeking that which he does because it has neither limit nor measure, right? So it's a whole, it, the whole thing is twisted. It's a twisted mindset to demand of Hashem that he should show you the money, <laughs> right? Show me the money before you start serving him. What, what do you want? What do you want already? You don't know how much you're going to need. You don't know how many years you are in this world. You don't know how many children, you don't know how many, you don't know anything. Well, what do you want from him? The third response to such a person, a person who takes a security pledge from his friend will only take a security pledge from him if he does not have any outstanding debts that he owes this friend. And if it did, and if he did not borrow money from him and from him at an earlier point in time, only then is he justified in his request for a security pledge, right? Makes sense. I'm going to take the security pledge, but if like there's, there's no debts outstanding, right? Okay. However, if he has an outstanding debt that he owes his friend and he's aware that he has these legitimate debts, then it makes no sense for you to also be asking for collateral. It makes no sense whatsoever to request a security pledge from his friend, nor would it be fitting for him to take the security pledge, pledge from his friend, even if the latter volunteered to give it to him. What chutzpah? If I owe you money, right? I'm going to tell you, oh, no, give me, give me, give me collateral. It doesn't make any sense right? It makes no sense to take a security pledge from someone to whom you owe money. It is for this reason that it makes no sense to take a security pledge from Hashem because you're completely indebted to Hashem, right? We're all indebted to Hashem. So how do we have the chutzpah to say, you know what, Hashem, when you show me everything, then I'll keep Shabbos. But now you're not showing me what I want. I, I, I need all guaranteed. I need it all guaranteed. And then I'll keep Shabbos. What chutzpah? What are we talking about? Right. It's like it's like asking to take uh, the security if we if we have a loan. It doesn't make sense. If we owe somebody money, we can't do that. We don't do that. Nobody would do that. All the more so does this apply to the creator. A security pledge should not be demanded of him because a person has many legitimate debts that he owes the creator. Right. Everything we have, everything we have, we don't have to have it. It's all a gift and nobody's charging us. We're not getting a bill for using our eyes, for breathing. We're not getting a bill for our heart pumping, right? It's all for free. The whole thing is for free. A person owes the creator, so to speak, for all the favors that he has given him. Were it possible to add up all the good deeds of all the people throughout history together and to consider it as if one person performed all of them, these good deeds would not be enough to repay God for even one kindness that the creator bestows upon him. How then is this brazen faced person not embarrassed to ask the creator to give him great favors in advance of his service of Hashem, in addition to those favors that he has given him in the past, right? He's constantly giving you favors, gifts. Surely his debt towards his creator will weigh down on him and perhaps he will not be able to fulfill his promise to serve him because his days will end and his time will come. So again, this is very all very dramatic. We have to understand that it's all trying to help us on, get to the ikar, to the main point, which is, are you focused on the relationship? It's all about the relationship, right? Don't be foolish. Don't be foolish. You have a relationship with the creator, your, your loving, caring father. Don't waste your time. Don't make demands that are absolutely ridiculous and are only going to hurt you. Just develop your relationship. You're in good hands. Trust him. Trust him. You're in good hands. One day at a time. Here he's going to give us an example. Okay. He's going to give us a, one of these dramatic examples. There was once a pious man who would proclaim to his fellow people, people, is it conceivable that the creator would demand of you today to fulfill the obligations of tomorrow or that which you are obligated to do afterward in a year or two from now? Right? Like I said, is, is, it, is it actually a thing that Hashem 
tells you today to fulfill tomorrow's obligations or what you need to do in a couple of years? What's the answer? How would it be conceivable that it would be demanded from us to fulfill future obligations today when we don't know if we will live to reach those days when we will become obligated to fulfill them, right? Today, you need to do what you need to do today. Hashem doesn't ask you to, in advance, pay what you're going to need to do uh, next uh, Rosh Hashanah, next Yom Kippur, and next Sukkot. No, today, right? However, we can be... Uh, we can be obligated in a defined amount of service during the present time. And only when we reach the future time, we will become obligated in the service of that time, right? That's how it works. That's how it works. So then the pious man said to them, similarly, the creator, may he be blessed, has guaranteed your present sustenance for the present time. And in return, it is incumbent upon you to fulfill a set service of Hashem right now. He's not asking you for tomorrow's to fill in. He's asking you for today's to fill in. Just as he will never demand his service of you before it's time, so too it is fitting that you have shame and refrain from asking for sustenance before it's time arrives. Stay in the moment. Why then do I see you asking him for the sustenance of the years to come when you don't even know if you will live until then? Furthermore, you even ask that he give you in advance the sustenance for your future wife and children-to-be who haven't even been born yet. Additionally, you do not merely ask for food, but you ask for food as well as for other excess desires for those times that are not yet known to you, the future, even though you are not guaranteed to still be alive during those times. Not only do you not serve him in lieu of his guarantee to provide for you in the future, you don't even make an accounting with yourself regarding that which you have ignored, the service of Hashem during the past days, during which he did not neglect you to neglect to provide you fully with your sustenance. So it's like he's calling out the entire chutzpah. You're, you're not even serving Hashem because you want him to fulfill all of your future needs. And you don't even know what that means because it's dot, dot, dot. You don't know if the future is 30 seconds from now or 30 years from now. You don't know what future is, Okay or what that amount is. But now you're not even taking into account now the fact that you're not serving him the hand that you have a debt you have a debt for all everything he's giving you now and the fact that you're going to continue neglecting your responsibility so already you're still indebted to Hashem it's 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 cycle right although the person without bitachon failed to fulfill his responsibilities towards Hashem Hashem nevertheless provided him with the sustenance because by the way, he didn't, he didn't stop when you had that, when you, when the person had that attitude, Hashem didn't stop providing him. You still had health and you still had money and you still had bread at the table and your car was still working and da, 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 everything was right. Everything. He, you, he, you were still here. You were breathing. He didn't stop giving you, even though you had the chutzpah to stop serving him because you want, uh, you, you wanted everything before, ahead of time right? And then you will serving. So he didn't stop giving you. It would therefore behoove him at the very least to repent for his failure to repay Hashem through serving him. Okay. So what's the fourth response? The fourth response to such a person, a person who takes a security pledge from his friend does so for one of three reasons. One, out of concern that perhaps his friend friend or this person he's doing business with will become poor and hence will be unable to pay his debt. Okay. So if I, if I have a feeling that maybe, maybe this guy is not going to be able to pay me back. Okay, so I'm going to take collateral collateral or number two, out of a concern that perhaps he will intentionally refuse to pay his debt. Or what if it's not that something happens to him and he can't pay me back? What if the guy actually doesn't, doesn't pay back? The guy doesn't pay, pay back loans. Uh, I better take collateral, right? Okay. If I'm thinking like those two situations, I'm going to take collateral. Or number three, perhaps his friends will die or be, in it, be unable to find him. The security pledge is widely considered to be a remedy for all three problems, right? So it's a way to mitigate risk. Makes sense? You think it's a risky transaction because the guy might not be able to find you, because the guy might intentionally not want to pay, right? Or the guy might not have money to pay. So you mitigate your risk by taking collateral. All right. 
So the author continues by saying that these reasons apply only to humans. But with God, these three concerns do not apply. God's not going anywhere. He's not going to forget where to find you. He doesn't run out of money, right? And what was the other one? What was the other one? Run out of money. Oh, and, and intentionally refuse to pay his debt. No, no, God is good and kind and he's not, doesn't, he's not out to get you, okay? So with God, these three concerns do not apply and that as such, it makes no sense to take a security pledge from him. If people were to be confident with each other insofar as these three concerns, it would without a doubt be, uh, it would without a doubt be considered a disgrace for them to take security pledges from each other. Obviously, if I know that you're a credit worthy person and you always pay back your debts and I have full confidence that you're going to come back and you're not going to run away with the thing, right? You're going to with the with the money you're going to pay me back, then obviously I'm not going to ask for collateral. So all the more so when it comes to the creator, may he be blessed, regarding whom these traits are not applicable at all. He's not going anywhere. He's not running out of money. And he's not intentionally stealing your money. It is even more disgraceful and astonishing that people should take security pledges from him. The author now quotes two verses that state that all the wealth of the world comes from Hashem. The verse states, states, the silver is mine and the gold is mine. Similarly, and wealth and honor are from before you. Therefore, it makes no sense to take a security pledge from Hashem by making efforts to amass wealth for the person's entire life. Instead, he should trust that Hashem will provide for him when the time comes. So again, we're just debunking this entire mindset of show me the money and then I will take care of my soul and then I will take care of my relationship with you. Like, He's just shredding it apart. The fifth response to such a person. A person takes a security pledge from his friend to have peace of mind since he plans on using the pledge as payment for the debt that is owed to him to benefit from it or to sell it or swap it and use the money or object he receives in, in, uh, he receives in return as payment for the debt that is owed to him. So again, he's mitigating his risk. So if he doesn't get his money back, okay, so he sells the security, the collateral, right? And 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 and, and that, that's going to help him. However, the claim of a person who thinks that he will have peace of mind from the worries of this world if the creator gives him his needs in advance is false because he cannot be confident that the money will remain in his possession. For a mishap might possibly happen to him that he will separate him from it as the verse states, he shall leave them in the midst of this day. So the point of this fifth one is that the security pledge gives the person peace of mind. Okay, so I, I got into this business deal, but at least okay, at least I know I'm going to get something. Like if something happens, okay, so I'll, the collateral will cover it, right? The security pledge will cover it. So here he's saying, okay, fine, but this doesn't apply to Hashem. Because he, if you think that you're going to have peace of mind from the worries of the world, by Hashem giving it to you in advance, that's completely misconstrued because you you cannot be confident that if Hashem gives it to you all in advance, let's say let's say somehow there's a a calculation, He gives it to you all now before you start keeping Shabbos or whatever it is that you need to do, right? Who's to say it's going to stay with you? What? Anything can happen. A person who has amassed great wealth is still not guaranteed of peace of peace of mind because it is possible that he's gonna he will lose his money. Furthermore, as the author continues, even if he holds onto his wealth, it is possible that he will not have peace of mind, right? This whole thing is about peace of mind, right? The menuchas and the peace of mind and the feeling of tranquility. That, that which they claim regarding the peace of mind they will have when they obtain the riches of the world that they desire is a false claim. And it is foolish of them to seek this because it is possible that the riches themselves will be a significant cause of their troubles and grief. As the rabbis of blessed memory said, a person who increases possessions increases worry. The whole point that a person should think that when I'm wealthy and Hashem, show it to me now, give it to me now, right? And then I'm going to be, I'm not just half peace of mind and then we'll talk Shabbos. Then we'll talk many and then we'll talk to tefillin. It's, it's the whole thing is misconstrued. Who says that because when you have the wealth, you have peace of mind? You only have peace of mind when you have Hashem. Right at this point, we should know this already because we're in chapter six. At this point, it's like, okay, we got it, Rabbi Nawahia, we got it. Yes, the, the, the peace of mind, the tranquility, it only comes from God. It cannot come from the bank account. If if, if, if I still feel that it comes from the bank account, then I gotta go back to chapter one. I gotta start, I gotta go back to the introduction, right? So by now, he's already everything he's telling us is like, okay, fine, yes, 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 I get it. I'm not gonna fall into this trap, okay. 
as the Mishnah attest, a person's wealth can be the cause of his stress. And we see it so often. We see it so often. So I gave you this example of Mr. Sami Rohr. What's so beautiful with the example? He was so wealthy, Kenai Nahara, right? All, all he saw is, right now, what I have is the best. He was just attached to Hashem. What, what more mitzvah can be done, right? He was just in that place of infinite gratitude. His reliance was not in the money, right? His all reliance is, I'm here. I have right now. Not only do I have, what I have is the best. It's, it's like, a, it's a, a mind-blowing thing. And we're, and we spend so much energy criticizing. Oh, this car is falling apart. And my husband is this. And my, this one is that. And my dad, blah, blah. right? It's like, whoa, can we snap out of it? Right? Can we snap out of it? We can. It takes work, but we can. As the Mishnah attests, a person's wealth can be the cause of his stress. So even if he does not lose money, it is still foolish to think that he will have peace of mind as a result. It's, it's just, we have to get it because if, if, you know, if you, if you're not happy now, you're not going to be happy with it. The happiness doesn't come from the thing that you get. The peace of mind doesn't come from that thing that you get. It's inner work. It comes from within. It only comes from your relationship to Hashem your relationship with your soul. That's what it is. Okay? That's where it's at. Let's let's see the sixth response that we give to such a person. Where the person who is taking the security pledge from his friend to be sure that his friend will repay his debt before its due, due date and will pay him double the amount that he owes him in return for his waiting as a kindness toward him, then he would certainly never take a security pledge from him. So if you extend the loan and you know that this guy is going to pay you on time, he always pays on time. Not only does he pay on time, but he pays double. He pays early and, and he pays extra, Right. Okay, so you're not going to take up security pledge from him because all the risk is mitigated already, right? And he, here we are speaking of the creator, may he be blessed, about whom we know of his good conduct with us and his abundant kindness to us both recently as well as in the past, right? We were born, we were taken care of, we were sheltered, we were given health, like we're still here many, many years later, right? And that he repays us for our acts of charity and service with a reward that cannot be grasped by human intellect and certainly cannot be articulated. And we already learned how he pays, right? We know that the payment that Hashem gives is inf to the point that to the point that we discussed in chapter uh, four, five, four, to the point that we discussed in chapter four, that the Torah can't even, can, can even explain what the rewards in the world to come are because we cannot, we, we can't grasp it. We can't even grasp it. So you're asking collateral from someone who doesn't just, not only that he pays on time, right? But he pays not double, infinitely, right? The payment that we get for it, 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 it's like the math we're off if we think like oh because i did this good deed this is this point no, no no you have no idea what you're creating with your good deed right we don't have no idea how hashem is going to reward you for all of that okay so a verse is now quoted as a source that the reward namely the reward in the world to come is indescribable and beyond human intellect as it is written, no eye had ever seen God besides yours, what is prepared for him who waits for you. Since God's kindness to us is unlimited, it is even a, more of a great disgrace if we were to take a security pledge from him. How could we have the chutzpah to say, Hashem, show it to me first and then we'll talk relationship. Then we'll talk to Philin. Right? It, it would be so shameful because Hashem is so kind. And not only that he's kind, he's been kind to us in the past and he's kind to us in the present, but the kindness that he's going to bestow on us in the future, the payment that he's giving us is so infinite to the point that we we have no grasp. To, we don't have, just like, just like I can, I don't know what a billion dollars is because like, it just like, what? Right? Like I look at my checking, I don't know what a billion dollars is, right? We'll imagine, uh, what do we know? Infinity, right? Okay. So let's finish up this chapter. Let's do the seventh one. I know we're a little bit past time, but let's finish the chapter. The seventh response to such a person person who takes a security pledge from his friend 
only takes a pledge if he is able to supply his friend with merchandise that corresponds to the value of the security pledge. However, a person who takes a security pledge from the creator, may he be blessed, by requesting God's kindness in advance of fulfilling his obligations towards him, does not have the capability to repay with the service of God because he's not even assured that he will be able to repay his old debts, all the more so that he can't be sure that he will be able to pay back the new debts. For even a righteous man would not be able to repay Hashem for the good that he has bestowed upon him, were it not for God's helping him, right? We talked about Hashem's abundant kindness and like how the math doesn't work. We talked about it a few chapters ago. So this he brings it back again here with the example of the show me the money mentality. So an average person might not be able to repay God for his kindness. Furthermore, even a righteous person needs help from God to serve him. This being the case, it makes no sense for a person to request the kindness of God in advance because it's unlikely that he will be able of repaying, capable of repaying it. As one of the pious men said in his praises of Hashem, even the intellectual who knows you does not glory in his actions. Rather, he praises your name and your mercy because you prepared his heart so that it is able to know you. For through you and your help, all the children of Israel will be found to be righteous and praised, saying, we have gloried in God all day long and we will forever praise your name. So even the righteous need God's help to be righteous and know him. All the more so does an average person need God's help to fulfill the mitzvot. So again, that is the end of this idea. Um, don't be one of those people with a show me the money mentality, you know, show it to me now and then I'll take care of you, Hashem, then I'll do what you want. And it's been debunked right now in chapter six. And we are at the end. We're at the wrap up. Literally next week, we're going to finish this whole book. I can't believe it. So chapter seven is basically, I'm going to tell you what we're going to do, although I, I should probably stop talking, but he's going to, he's going to give us some troubleshooting tips. Okay. And should give us a little bit of troubleshooting just in case. And then he's going to tell us the different levels of trust. Um, that's what's going to come up in next in chapter um, seven. Any, any questions, any stories? Okay. 